Hello, and welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Saturdays for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren, and I am your host. Uh, it's a big one today. This is going to be arguably uh, the most complex, the most, uh, at times, confusing uh, lecture that I'm, I will have brought you so far in this, in this little series we're doing here. Uh, today, we're doing the uh, sort of post uh, Fourth Crusade lecture and everything, all the chaos that goes on after the Fourth Crusade, because obviously we talked about last time in the last lecture we did. I know it's been a, a while. There have been some other uh, pieces of content that I've been working on here. There's going to be uh, our first our first collaboration here fairly soon is going to be coming out um, in uh, not actually, yeah, I think possibly this weekend. Um, but so uh, that's delayed some of the other some of the other content, but we should be wrapping up the Byzantine series soon here. This is actually uh, another, another interesting thing that kind of we have going forward here. I've planned out the topics for the last you know half dozen lectures or so, and none of them are really going to involve uh, actual Byzantine uh, activity. It's really only going to be about uh, we're going to be talking about like the Ottomans, the Timurids, the Serbians. Uh, Hungarians and a lot of outside groups that are not uh, the Byzantines, but are going to be kind of fighting over the territory that the Byzantines once once held. And so for this for this duration of time here, uh, we're really just going to be talking about kind of outsiders leading up to the obvious uh, fall of Constantinople in uh, 1453. But so here we go. Uh, <laughs> Like I said, this has been writing this writing this uh, kind of lecture outline, as well as uh, you know doing the research for it. You know, kind of definitely leaves your head uh, spinning a bit in terms of the names and and uh, you know one person comes to power, and then they then they die, and then another person comes in, and then they're soon assassinated or whatever the case may be, right? But so uh, I I do want to say right off the bat, uh, a lot of the uh, research I did. For this comes from uh, Kings and Generals YouTube channel. Uh, did a real nice uh, series on on the Fourth Crusade and then the aftermath of it, and then the uh, the reinstating the rein the reinstatement uh, of the Byzantine Empire after that. And so that's that's the period we're going to be talking about here today. So from fall of Constantinople uh, in 1204 all the way up to uh, what is ultimately about uh, 1259, when uh, when the when the Byzantines get back into Constantinople, it's going to be it's going to be a long one. It's going to be it's going to be an interesting one. So, where we last left our story, uh, like I said, uh, the Crusader a, a, com, a com, combination force of Crusaders and Venetians had just sacked Constantinople, basically ending the Fourth Crusade. This broke up the Byzantine Empire. Now the Byz now. There are going to be several uh, uh, Greek states that still remain from this, namely the Empire of Nicaea, which is going to be the most important player, uh, the Despotate of Epirus, the Kingdom of Thessalonica, and the Empire of Trebizond. Okay, so these are four what we'll call Byzantine rum states from here who are still going to be playing a, a, a role. There's certainly still going to be factors in all of the events going forward. Now, uh, in place in Constantinople, the Crusaders and the Venetians found uh, what is later on called the Latin Empire, although they continue to still call it the Roman Empire. Although one can hardly call it an empire because uh, when you look on a map, uh, the area where uh, the Latin Empire is, it's, it's Constantinople, a tiny little bit of Thrace, and then a tiny little bit of Anatolia. And you know, you're seeing all these different names, you know, the Empire of Nicaea, the Empire, the, the Latin Empire. And you're thinking of these big, vast expanses of territory and, and many people under under their control. And then you look at it on a map, and it's these tiny little bit of little areas. Okay. Uh, then we're also another major player in this is going to be uh, what's called the Second Tsardom of Bulgaria. Now we've talked about the Bulgars, or I think I think by this time you can call them Bulgarians, um, but uh, they're they're going to be playing a major factor as well. They've become uh, uh, a real power player in the region, especially uh, since, or I should say, after uh, Basil the Bulgar Slayer uh, kind of put them in their place many, you know, episodes and a couple centuries ago here, and, uh, chronologically speaking. Uh, but so the Latin Empire of 
uh, again, of the Crusaders and the Venetians. Uh, it mostly maintains the, the Roman or what we would now call Byzantine uh, polity, the, the same political system, or well, I should, well, not necessarily in the city, but in, in the city, you know, the same court system, a lot of the same uh, uh, norms, a lot of the same customs were maintained in order to try to maintain some sort of continuity and for uh, the Latins to try to gain popularity with the locals. Uh, essentially what happened was you just had a leadership change there on, on the throne. Uh, the Venetians were also allowed to control a portion of the land and also held a quarter of the city, uh, which was known as the Venetian Quarter. Uh, and then another thing the Latins did that kind of shake things up here, aside from destroying an empire, um, was to create a Latin patriarchate in Constantinople. And the Latins also create a fiefdom type political uh, system in the countryside of the territory which they control. Uh, some people would call it a feudal uh, uh, system. However, uh, I think I've mentioned this one before, uh, the term feudalism uh, is really not used by any sort of serious medievalist um, uh, in the last couple, last decade or two, I would say. Uh, so, so it's more, you know, they create, the, the, the Latins end up creating fiefs, or fiefs, I should say, uh, which were granted to lords, and the lords had to play, uh, pledge fealty to the emperor, similar to systems like you would see in, uh, in France, for example, or someone similar to uh, what you would see in Germany, although those two uh, areas had different, uh, certain different approaches, but a similar uh, style of, of system there in the Middle Ages. Now they also needed to elect a new emperor, did the Latins, and so uh, there were basically there were electors. There was an even number of crusaders and Venetians who were uh, chosen to vote on who the new emperor would be, which was a bit of a, uh, not, perhaps not the best idea because when you have an even number of two people from different groups, you know, you would likely to have a split election. Um, but so Baldwin of Flanders was selected as the first emperor over uh, Boniface of Montferrat, who was uh, the leader of the, of the Fourth Crusade. Uh, and the real reason for this was because the Venetians were concerned that uh, Boniface Montferrat, who uh, Montferrat was the, er uh, was the area in Italy where Boniface was from, and it was close to Genoa. And Genoa was another Italian city-state which uh, had a big rivalry with the Venetians in terms of uh, uh, trade and, and that sort of thing. There were the two, Genoa and, and Venice were the two real Italian rivals there at the time. And so uh, Baldwin of Flanders was chosen because his uh, uh, loyalties would have been outside of Italy and the Venetians didn't view him as much of a threat. Uh, Boniface of Montferrat for his part was not too happy that he led this whole dang thing and didn't get to be the emperor of this new empire, empire they've created here. Uh, and so Boniface insisted on receiving uh, Thessalonica the second city, which was the second city of the empire at the time. Uh, and so he essentially Boniface gets the kingdom of Thessalonica there. Now the Greek uh, citizens in the Latin, uh, I should say some Greek citizens in the Latin empire, it wasn't obviously universal, uh, but there were some Greek citizens who did not like their new overlords. And so they called upon the Bulgarian czar named Callian uh, to liberate them from their new overlords. And so what Callian does, uh, he likes this idea. Obviously, he kind of he's a, an expansionist guy. He wants to be able to control, to expand his territory. He's not fond of the Latins, uh, especially because you know they've been, they have an emperor who was recognized by the Pope like right off the bat. And Callian had spent many years trying to get the Pope to recognize him in his uh, czardom and his title of czar. Uh, Going, sorry, just reading through the notes here. I kind of got a bit, a bit ahead of myself here in the notes. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, so Callian's idea here is that he's going to send some rabble rousers into the new Latin territory to create rebellions, and then he'll come, he'll sweep back through, and he'll take over those those cities. And so Callian does that uh, to a couple of cities under Latin control in 1204, and uh, one of which was Adrianople. Now this is the same Adrianople. Uh, at the famous battle where the, the Romans were, were catastrophically defeated by the Goths there back in the uh, fourth century. It's the, same, it's the same city. So we're gonna have another battle of Adrianople here coming up, but different 
you know, I'm not, I'm not getting my years confused here. There, there's two, there's two different battles of Adrianople. We're talking about the Battle of Adrianople in 1205. So, the uh, Adrianople is taken over by these, uh, by these Greek rebels, and so Emperor Baldwin, Doge Enrico Dondolo, who is still alive. Remember, he is the Venetian Doge. He's in his late 90s, something like 98 years old, uh, and he's blind. But he was the Venetian leader during the uh, Fourth Crusade there. Uh, and so Emperor Baldwin, uh, again, of Flanders, uh, Enrico Dondolo, and then uh, Count Louis of Blois uh, marched towards Adrianople with about 5,000 men uh, to take it back from the Bulgar uh, insurrectionists. Now, the Crusaders hoped to retake the city before Callian could arrive, but that did not happen. Uh, the Crusaders are still besieging the city, uh, and obviously Callian is going to hear about this, and so he's going to march down with his army because both of these groups here are vying over the same city. And so Callian arrives at Adrianople on April 13th with his army, which contains uh, a good number of Cuman uh, light cavalry. This is not the first time we've encountered the Cumans uh, here before in this lecture series. Again, the Cumans are a uh, Central Asian uh, Turkic, uh, you call them either nomadic or semi-nomadic people. Uh, the Byzantines have fought with them for a number of years before this. And at this point in time, uh, the Cumans are uh, being, you know, uh, many of them are serving in the Bulgarian military. A lot of them are living in Bulgarian Sardom. Uh, and so Kalyan is going to employ, you know, and they're going to they're going to play a major role in not just this battle, but uh, other ones here uh, moving forward. And so what happens in this battle is that the Cumin uh, horse archers uh, baited a number of Crusader heavy cavalry into a chase. Uh, Count Louis of Blois, uh, perhaps seeking glory for himself or being a bit of a hothead, uh, led his group of knights, the knights who were under his command, uh, into a classic faint retreat. Uh, from the Cumans, he's, you know, as, as the siege is going on, uh, the Cuman horse archers show up and they start firing at the, at the Crusader army. Louis of Bois takes his knights and uh, pursues them in a chase, which is exactly what the Cumans want in that situation. They draw them back towards the main Bulgar army uh, for, again, the classic faint retreat. And Baldwin... Uh, notices that Louis has gotten himself in some trouble here. So Baldwin takes a larger group of knights and tries to pursue Louis to get him out of his predicament there. Uh, but it really doesn't work. And, and uh, many of those knights are killed. Uh, Louis was, uh, or sorry, Baldwin was captured. Louis uh, died in this. So it's a, it, the, what remained of the Crusader army was able to hold up in the camp until nightfall. And then the Bulgarians uh, broke, you know, they went and, and came for the night themselves. And uh, during the night, what remained of the Crusader army uh, slipped away from the battlefield. They were able to escape back to Constantinople. Now, one would think that this is a good situation for Kalyan because he's defeated the Crusader army and he had this uh, city rebel for him against the Latins. Uh, but what happened was the Greeks who had rebelled in Adrianople did not welcome Kalyan as their new leader. Uh, which Callian was obviously not happy about because that was part of the deal here. And so, not very happy, enraged, uh, Callian raised several other cities in northern Greece uh, before uh, returning back to Bulgaria. And during this time, he actually earned the nickname the Roman Slayer, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, Basil, the, it's interesting uh, what, uh, what they were saying was uh, Basil the Bulgar Slayer. Uh, earned that title posthumously, right? He didn't, uh, people didn't start calling him that, him that until after his death. But with Callian, he was named, nicknamed the Roman Slayer uh, during his own lifetime. So that's, that's kind of cool. That's, that's definitely a Chad move there. Uh, in the meantime, the emperor, uh, sorry, the empire of Nicaea under a guy named uh, Theodore Lascaris, uh, who will hear the name Lascaris a number of times here during this lecture, uh, he defeated several neighbors uh, to become the most powerful Byzantine rump state in Asia Minor, which is a grand title to be sure, yes. Going from you know, the Byzantine emperor, the most powerful uh, uh, regent in the world, to uh, <laughs> the most powerful Byzantine rump state on this half of Asia Minor, which was not even the most powerful state in Asia Minor at the time. That was the, the, the Sultan of Rum, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, Lascaris, for his part, 
uh, once he had kind of consolidated power there in Asia Minor, uh, proposed to Kalyan to form an alliance and to have a joint attack on Constantinople to knock out the Latins. Uh, both of them attempted to, but neither one of their armies actually ended up reaching Constantinople. So the Latins survived to fight another day. And we're just we're just getting into this, man. We're <laughs> 1207 is the year we're talking about next year. This goes on again until uh, 1259, and there's there's several more. There's like five or six pages of notes left. Uh, so in 1207, Callian was assassinated which provided a breath of relief to both Latins and Greeks alike, because again, he had, he had destroyed uh, a number of uh, those, again, the Ro Romans, you know, uh, pe Byzantine people who lived in the Byzantine empire would have thought of themselves as Roman, although Greek speaking here. Uh, then in 1208, Boreal, who is the nephew of Callian, assumed the Bulgarian throne and married a, the, the Cuman queen, now, this was the wife of Callian. Her, her name is um, not really known for sure. I've seen some people say Anna, but it's not necessarily, it, it's not known, absolutely. So in some places, she's just referred to as the Cumin Queen. Uh, I guess I guess she was maybe really into Texas chili, or I'm sorry, no, that's Cumin, not Cumin. Similar, very, very different, but very same. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, some people think that Boreal was part of the plot to assassinate Callian because he married his wife, right? And so there are people who think that uh, uh, Boreal and Callian's wife conspired to take him out and then uh, arranged for to, to marry each other. And then this called the 14-year-old, I'm sorry, ca caused the 14-year-old heir, uh, I believe this is um, uh, Callian's son here, uh, Ivan Essen II, who was only 14 years old, he flees to uh, Kavian Rus, uh, who were enemy with the Cuman, with the Cumans at the time, um, for you know, basically in, in a sort of political exile here. Uh, obviously, he's fearing for his own life. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, in 1211, Boreal. Uh, creates an anti-Latin coalition with the Nicaeans and several Bulgarian uh, separatist groups. Uh, Boreal uh, leads an army of Bulgars to assist, uh, or sorry, against Thessalonica, uh, but they're repelled with the help of Michael Ducas Comnenus, who was the leader of the despotate of Epirus, who uh, uh, Michael Ducas Comnenus uh, always one to kind of play both sides of the issue. He's both a Ducas and a Comnenus. And he also had converted to Catholicism uh, because he's trying to placate the Pope as well as trying to get himself uh, uh, back, you know, into the Byzantine uh, throne there and to become the next, you know, the next uh, Eastern emperor there out of Constantinople. Now, uh, Moving our attention a little further south here, uh, the Battle of Antioch on the Meander, which is in the south uh, western Anatolia, uh, where the Nicaeans under uh, Theodore Lascaris uh, defeated an army from the Sultanate of Rum, who was also fighting, they were fighting with uh, Alexius III, who we talked about last time. Uh, he had been released, Alexius III had been released from captivity and was uh, basically being housed uh, within the Sultanate of Rum, which uh, the Sultanate of Rum, uh, I should say, is basically at this point of time, at this point in time, controls kind of central and eastern Anatolia. Uh, now, Theodore Lascaris during this battle was personally captured by the Sultan uh, from the Sultanate of Rum, uh, but he manages to maim the Sultan's horse. I believe it says that he like uh, uh, cut, he cut off the leg of the horse, which I, I don't necessarily know because he's basically being like lassoed and dragged away or some, something along these lines. So I don't think he'd be able to even generate enough power to cut off the leg of the horse. But either way, he maims the horse, uh, which then causes the Sultan to fall off his horse. Lascaris uh, gets his hands on him and cuts his head off. And Lascaris puts the Sultan's head on a pike, which causes uh, the Sultan's army to flee, even though at that point, by that point in time in the battle, uh, Lascaris' army had been beaten back pretty badly, and Lascaris himself was basically about to be captured, or had had been captured, and really he escapes captivity. 
And then also in 1211, uh, Trebizond, the empire of Trebizond, becomes a Seljuk uh, vassal. Uh, Seljuks also, refer, again, referring to the Sultan of Drum there. And so uh, the empire of Trebizond, uh, which was actually controlled by uh, the Comnenus family. Uh, there's some remnants of the Comnenus, Comnenus family out there uh, in Trebizond, which is in like way far eastern uh, Anatolia. Uh, they're kind of out of the, they're out of the running for uh, getting onto the throne there in Constantinople. Now, later on, Boreal, uh, again, the Bulgarian czar here, uh, offers to marry his daughter to Henry of Flanders, who is the Latin emperor at this point in time. Baldwin has, has uh, passed, and his son Henry is now the new Latin emperor. So Boreal offers to return, sorry, to uh, marry his daughter to Henry of Flanders, as well as return the Bulgar lands uh, to the Latins, which Callian had recently taken, and he also agrees to become the vassal of the Latins, which is a real odd, um, it's a real odd move here because he's not in a position of weakness. He's not about to be taken over by the Latins. The Latins are in a, in a real position of weakness here, and so it's really odd that Boreal makes so many concessions to the Latins, really seemingly without without needing to. I, I don't I don't understand what the impetus for this was. But anyway, uh, in 1216, <clears throat> uh, Emperor Henry was poisoned, again, Henry of Flanders. And so uh, the next guy here on the throne is uh, Peter of Courtenay, who was uh, selected to, to be the next emperor. Then also in 1216, a Bulgarian coup ousted uh, Boreal there as the czar in Bulgaria in favor of Ivan Asin II, who at this point in time has returned from his exile in Kievian Rus. Now, Ivan Asin was known for his diplomacy and trying to maintain the status quo as opposed to uh, belligerence, uh, unlike other czars before him, uh, like his father, for example, uh, there, Kalyan. Now, also in 1216, uh, Theodore Ducas of the Despotate of Epirus hosted uh, what's called, what some call the Red Wedding, where essentially what happens is he, le he lures uh, Peter Courtenay and his, and his uh, entourage to a banquet. And Ducas uh, essentially gets them all drunk at the banquet. Uh, and then when, they're, uh, when they've all had too much to drink and they're kind of out of their wits, uh, uh, Theodore Ducas has them all murdered. Uh, and now, but have no fear. Theodore Ducas later told the Pope that he really regretted his decision and he wishes he didn't do it. I'm sure. I'm sure you didn't, man. Not that not that something like that requires, you know, a, a mass amount of planning and you have plenty of time to think about whether or not you're going to do it and you still go through with it. But he's really sorry. <laughs> uh, in 1221 here, Theodore Lascaris of Nicaea dies uh, and, you know, he had a pretty good run there. He really solidified power. You know, he's in kind of a that's a great situation for a Byzantine emperor, and he kind of leaves it, he leaves his state in better uh, in a better position than when he found it. Now the same year, uh, Robert uh, Courtenay, who's the son of Peter Courtenay, rises as the new uh, Latin emperor. Now uh, and then John Ducas uh, III, who was aided by Robert, becomes the new emperor of Nicaea. So John the Third Ducas is the now the uh, Nicaean emperor. For now. In 1223, Theodore Ducas takes uh, Thessalonica, so he, he's controlling both here the Kingdom of Thessalonica and the Despotate of Epirus. Um, and Ducas also takes Adrianople, uh, which leaves the Latins with barely any land to hang on to. They're basically controlling Constantinople and the little bit of land that surrounds it. They've basically lost all their Asian holdings at this point in time, and they've also lost all, basically all their Thracian holdings at this point in time. Now, uh, 1228, Emperor Robert Courtenay dies, which creates a golden opportunity for the enemies of the Latins to strike. But as we're going to see here, it, we still, <laughs> this is only 1228, and we still have about 30 more years, uh, 20, 20, 30 more years until this whole situation gets resolved, right? So uh, Ivan Assen then offered to marry one of his daughters to the 10-year-old ten year Baldwin II to take up the regency, right? So Baldwin II is the son of uh, Robert here. Obviously, there needs to be a regent that goes on. So Ivan Asin offers 
to create a marriage between himself and the Latins. And then he offers to uh, manage Baldwin's regency until Baldwin is old enough to reign itself. Now the nobility in Constantinople <clears throat> initially offers, uh, initially accepts this offer. But at the same time, they're also doing some negotiating behind the scenes because they're like, we don't, they're like, uh, we don't really want this uh, Ivan Assen guy to be uh, lording over as the region here in Constantinople. You know, they don't want to let an outsider in. They want to get, they want to get a Westerner in there, basically. And they, and they find their Westerner and they settle on a man from France whose name was John of Brienne, right? And so Ivan Assen obviously was not happy with the, with the results of this situation. And he therefore formed an alliance with Theodore Ducas against the Latins, uh, which would have worked out possibly had Theodore Ducas not quickly betrayed the Bulgarians and then invaded him when he was marching on his way to fight with the Bulgarians to take Constantinople. Okay, and so in 1230, this leads to the Battle of the Klokutsna River, uh, which is there in the Balkans. Uh, kind of in Thrace, Bulgaria, that area, uh, where Ivan Assen and Theodore Ducas meet for battle, because I was, as we said, uh, Theodore Ducas has invaded Bulgaria. And so basically what happens here, they're along a river, uh, the, uh, the Bulgarians are deployed uh, defending their side of the river, and then there's a wooded hill behind them, there's kind of a field, and then a wooded hill behind them there, where they're hiding uh, a contingent of Cuman horse archers. Now, Theodore Ducas bullishly uh, crosses the river uh, because he sees that his force is larger than the Bulgarian force, and so he wants to rush across the river, crush them, win a quick victory. However, the Bulgarian forces hold up on their side of the river, fight very bravely, uh, which allowed enough time for the Cuman uh, contingent of horse archers, which were hidden on the hill behind them, to come out of their hiding, wheel around the flank of the Thessalians here, and then uh, cause a mass route. Mass route. They kind of roll up the flank of the Thessalian army here, and then uh, Theodore's army is knocked out. And with this victory, much of the kingdom of the uh, sorry, the kingdom of Thessalonica is going to fall under the control of Ivan Assen and the uh, and the Bulgarians here. Moving forward now, in 1234, uh, we see the creation of a Serbian-Bulgarian alliance. Serbia is kind of starting. Uh, developing here as an upstart state here in the Balkans. They're going to become fairly powerful players uh, moving forward. We'll talk about them more in future lectures. Uh, but after this, Ivan Assen then seeks an alliance with the Empire of Nicaea to finally put the Latins away once and for all. <laughs> Not so fast. The, 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 Emp the Empire of the Latins here really knows how to ha hang on by, by a hair thread, um, by the skin of their teeth, by the fingernail, whatever you want to call it. They're, they're hanging on, but just barely. Uh, and so, so the Serbs, the Bulgarians, and the Nicaeans are all going to try to attack uh, and take Constantinople. So John of Brienne, who again is still the regent here in Constantinople over Baldwin II, who is too young to reign, uh, John of Brienne puts out uh, a plea for help, uh, sailed to, uh, sorry, sailed in by Venice. Uh, which he requested so the Venetians are sailing in the reinforcements here to help in the defense of Constantinople. So Constantinople is then besieged, and in 1236, the siege was lifted thanks to aid from Ital uh, a coalition of Italian uh, soldiers, which arrived. Again, the Venetians transported men. There's uh, Venetians, Genoans, and other uh, people from different Italian city-states coming in to aid in the defense of Constantinople. At this point in time, Bulgaria and Nicaea uh, agreed to sign a peace agreement with uh, the Latin Empire. So for now, the Latin Empire is safe. Ivan Assen, uh, at this one time, also turned his palace in uh, Tarnovo into a spiritual center, and he builds this uh, large uh, patriarchal cathedral there. It's kind of an interesting side religious and cultural note. In 1237, this is when the Mongols now arrive uh, at the doors of the Kievian Rus. Uh, and what's going to happen is as the Mongols are uh, you know, kind of ravaging through the Rusin uh, countryside, 
they're going to disrupt large groups of Cumans because not all the Cumans are living in Bulgaria. They're kind of dispersed out across, you know, the Balkans and the Eurasian steppe. <clears throat> and so uh, this is going to create a large movement of uh, Cumans out of Kievian Rus down the Black Sea coast and into the Bulgarian Tsardom. Now, where have we seen this before? A large uh, warlike and mostly nomadic group of Central Asians pours out of the steppes, is raiding through the Eurasian steppe, creating a mass wave of migration down towards the Danube River. Huh. I think we've covered something like that on this podcast before. Uh, but anyway, in, uh, th this is going to kind of hamper uh, the Bulgarians here. It's going to—they're uh, obviously going to have to deal with these, uh, uh, what are oftentimes hostile uh, uh, Cumans who are coming into their territory, and it's going to really kind of prevent them from making aggressive moves for a while here. Now, in 1239, uh, the Bulgarians and Hungary sign an alliance, a defensive alliance with each other. Uh, to uh, kind of resist the, the impending Mongol hordes, which unfortunately for them didn't do a whole lot because uh, those of us who know our history know that the Mongols, you know, just kind of rampaged through Poland and Hungary and got all the way down to Croatia and then crossed across the Balkans. They eventually um, encounter an army from the Latin Empire, uh, which they destroy. Um, and then, and then what's going to happen is that the, uh, the Mongols, uh, as they go back up towards what we would call the Golden Horde, they're kind of moving north along the Black Sea. Um, they're going to encounter an, an army of Bulgarians and they're going to be ambushed and uh, beaten pretty badly, which is then going to result in, uh, in the Mongols uh, uh, sending out more armies into Bulgaria and uh, raising uh, several cities in the Bulgarian Tsardom. Now, uh, Ivan Asin would not be uh, really uh, much help in this because uh, I, as we said, the Bulgarian, uh, the Bulgarian slash Hungarian alliance was signed in 1239 and in 1241, Ivan Asin dies. Ivan Asin then uh, is followed by his son, Kalaman, who is only seven years old at the time and he's going to require a regent. We already talked about the Mongols uh, uh, going through uh, going through Bulgaria. Now, in 1230, uh, sorry, yeah, 1243, uh, the Ilkhanate, which is uh, you know, so the Golden Horde we've uh, I mentioned earlier is kind of the portion of the Mongol Empire that's like in in Russia, Eurasia, that kind of northern area. The Ilkhanate is um, a portion of the Mongol Empire that's in the Middle East, so it's in like Iran and Iraq and getting close to the Sultanate of Rum here, which because, as we will see, uh, the Ilkhanate uh, defeats the Sultanate of Rum in a battle in eastern Anatolia and subjugates them. And so now the Sultan of Rum becomes a, a Mongol uh, you know, satrapy, protectorate, whatever you want to call it. They're, they're under their control there. In 1246, now, and, and so this is important because uh, for the Empire of Nicaea, it's going to kind of shore up their uh, eastern border here because now uh, the threat of the Sultan of Rum is not, it, it's not that it doesn't exist anymore, but it's been significantly neutralized. Now, uh, in 1246, Nicaea uh, ends up in control of Thessalonica as, a once, as the once blinded uh, Theodore Ducas had inserted himself in the situation, and he had uh, previous, previously been friends with John of Nicaea. Uh, uh, Theodore Ducas had been a bit of a bit of a rabble rouser, uh, and as a result, had been blinded. Uh, but and that's kind of supposed to be the end of him. But he was just not really willing to uh, uh, just go away quietly, and so he gets himself into Thessalonica there, and so the Empire of Nicaea controls now the Kingdom of Thessalonica as well. Now, also in 1246, the young Caliman, as well as the patriarch of the Bulgarian church, were assassinated after they both showed interest in reunifying the Bulgarian church with the Roman church, because I believe it was under Ivan Asin or Caliman when uh, the Bulgarian church was actually part of the Catholic church, but then they split off um, earlier here. I, I don't remember the exact years. My apologies. 
but uh, the young Caliban was then replaced with Michael Assen, who again was the was a descendant there of Ivan Assen. Uh, in 1247, John III solidified uh, Bulgaria, uh, Nicaea, obviously under himself, and Cuman forces. Uh, excuse me. To retake uh, uh, what parts of Thrace the Latin Empire still controlled. So again, the Latin Empire really just holding on by a thread here. They just couldn't. They're controlling a couple towns in the Thracian countryside, uh, but by by about 1247, they're going to lose those as well. In 1251, uh, John III encounters Michael and Theodore Ducas from Epirus, attempting to take Thessalonica. Okay, so we have the Ducas family here again, uh, kind of stirring the pot. Uh, however, uh, soon after, John III dies and he is replaced by uh, Theodore II Lascaris. So we see the Lascaris family here again uh, in control of the Empire of Nicaea. However, just a couple of years later, 1258, after a series of rash decisions, sorry, rash decisions, uh, possibly caused by a brain tumor, uh, Theodore Lascaris dies in a monastery. Uh, so he doesn't have a very productive reign here. And as we we are we are getting on here to the end, uh, in 1259, at the Battle of Pel uh, Pelagonia. Uh, all the major players in the region are now participating in this. The, the Latins, the Nicaeans, Thessalonica, Epirus, the Bulgars, the Cumans, uh, I don't know, <laughs> probably the Pope as well, um, are involved in this large battle, which is basically between John, John Paleologos, who is representing uh, the Empire of Nicaea, and then Michael II Ducas, who is um, representing uh uh, the despotate of emperors there. And uh, just to kind of shorten things here, John Paleologos ends up winning, although he is not the emperor of Nicaea. That's actually uh, a relative of his named Michael. And uh, so in 1261, uh, the Nicaeans are going to make their move on Constantinople because now they've basically knocked out any competitors in the region. And Nicaean forces are actually going to sneak into Constantinople. They managed to get some... Uh, get some guys up on the walls at night when uh, the Latins are out on a raid and the garrison is kind of low. And so they managed to get uh, a small force up on the walls, knock out the guards, open the gates, and the Nicene army can get into the city. And what Latin forces are left in the city, hop on some boats with the Venetians and get out of Dodge. And at this point in time, Michael Paleologos, who was actually in Nicaea at the time, I couldn't, <laughs> was very surprised that this plan actually worked. Uh, and so he rushes to Constantinople and he is crowned as emperor, restoring then the Byzantine Empire there in uh, 1261. So that was, uh, that, that's the story of how the Byzantines get back into Constantinople after the sack of Constantinople in 1204 by the Fourth Crusade. Uh, if you need to rewatch that <laughs> maybe a few times or, Go watch the uh, Kings and Generals bit in order to uh, really grasp the information. <laughs> I definitely don't blame you. I had to go over this uh, several times myself just to try to keep track of all the moving parts because there are so many of them. But if you've made it this far in the video and your head isn't spinning so much, make sure to click the like button, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please make sure to give us a follow there as well as a five star review. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and I'll see y'all next time.